Good morning and buenos dias. Welcome to the house of the Lord. We seek to worship God and to love one another in God's love as well. <coughs> Before, uh, bienvenidos a todos eh, a la casa del Señor donde adoramos al Señor y amamos a todos con el amor de Dios. Eh, before we transition to worship, we do have a couple of announcements. Um, antes de continuar con la adoración con la música, tenemos unos anuncios. Um, we're still working on a survey. Um, it's going to be sent out uh, soon on f ways for us to connect with everybody. Um, there's different ways, you know, by text message, phone calls, emails, um, social media. So we're just working on that. Uh, we'll be sending those out soon. Um, estamos trabajando en diferentes maneras para conectar con la, el, la congregación, este, sea por mensajes de, te de texto, por correo electrónico, por llamadas, eh, por medios sociales. Eh, we also have the youth center running um, not this Saturday, um, right? It will be the There we go. The Shining Light Ministry Youth Center will be meeting following Saturday at 5.30, the usual time. <coughs> and they, um, sorry, and the, we have two other things, um, which is a Tithely app and the Bible app. And for the teens, sorry, there is a movie night this Tuesday at 4. Um, yeah, I forgot this is vacation week for them, right? So, uh, Tuesday at 4, movie night. Um, este martes a las 4 va a haber una noche de películas para los uh, chicos que no están en las clases. Uh, we have the Tithely app and the Bible app, which you can donate to capital campaigns in the Tithely app, and you can follow along on the sermon on the Bible app. Tenemos dos aplicaciones que puedes encontrar en, en los celulares. Se llama Tithely. Y la otra es la, la aplicación de la Biblia. Eh, en Tithely puedes donar eh, para las ofrendas, diezmos o diferentes donaciones. Y en la aplicación de la Biblia puedes en, encontrar el sermón y puedes eh, ir leyendo mientras se está diciendo el sermón. Eh, and I think that's all the announcements we have for today. And we will continue to worship as we do a video. to stand, please do so. We'll be from Numbers and Revelation. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of all the people of Sheph. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the rock and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. Let's worship the Lord in song. Mm -hmm. 
Pray. 
going to continue worshiping God by listening to the scripture reading today. The reading is found in the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verse 2. La escritura se encuentra en el libro de Malaquías, capítulo 4, versículo 2. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Pero para ustedes que temen mi nombre, se levantará el sol de justicia, trayendo en sus rayos salud, y ustedes saldrán saltando como becerros recién alimentados. Thank you, God, for this word that you have given us today. May we understand the message, Lord, and you put your hands over um, Pastor John today. Señor, te damos las gracias por la palabra y te pedimos que podamos entender tu palabra, Señor, a través del Pastor John. Te pedimos en el dulce nombre de Jesús. Amen. Good morning. Check, check. Glory to Dios. God is good. Today, the sermon is Be the Bright Morning Star. How I love going on vacation and walking, waking up very early and seeing the sunset. Have you looked out in the bright sky just before the dawn breaks? As the sun is about to shine, look to the east and there you will see a bright morning star. As many of you know, this bright star is considered as the planet Venus. Brothers and sisters, scripture also talks about the bright and morning star. It's it is one of the many names the Bible calls Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day that we can celebrate your birth as well as 
celebrate you and worship you today. As, may you bless this word as it goes forth. Open hearts and ears as they hear your word. That the Holy Spirit will work through them and through me. May it be your words, not my words today. May you increase and I decrease. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Our sermon today is the bright morning star. A declaration of God's glory. Astronomy is one of the oldest sciences that is known to man. Like many other sciences, it is the origin in the occult and in the superstitious, the mythological and the mystical. Do you know the origins of chemistry is similar? The desire of early chemists is to change basic metals into silver and gold and try to prolong life indefinitely. Now it became known as science, and we all have taken it in college called chemistry. Astronomy was formerly known as astrology. It began filled with superstitions of all sorts. And the Bible warns against these superstitions. Yet today, many believe somehow the stars affect their lives. Somehow, if they are born under a certain star, they feel that they are a certain type of person. They have similar personalities and qualities. All of this is completely bogus because of the fact the stars have no effect whatsoever on who we are today. It has nothing to do with what we are going to accomplish or our nature. The first, the heavenly bodies were seen by men with the naked eye. So what, people, what brought people to the heavens was curiosity. Man wondered the beauty of the heavens. At first, astro astronomy was a pure science. It didn't seem to have any practical benefit. But today, all that has changed, hasn't it? Today, we have recently been researching Venus and Mars. A man-made robot determined that there's probably a vapor in Mars and Venus, which means there might likely be water. They're looking at the stars and the planets. M men are looking for a new meaning today. Actually, they're looking to try to find a place for man to go. We know that if there is water, then we can split the atoms and make oxygen. People are looking out yonder for men to go. They're looking for a place to land. Many are looking for a better place than this earth for a man to live. Today, if you have billions of dollars, you can actually go visit the moon and back. You can hang out with Elon Musk and his billionaires. But the word today, the word of God, turns man's attention repeatedly to the heavens. Scripture points to look up his eyes from down here on earth and look up into the heavens. In Psalms 19, 1, 2, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Psalms 19, 1, 2. You see, the heavens have no language, yet they speak to man. The heavens don't speak, have speech or language, yet they speak to every American. They don't speak in the thousand dialects that they have in the Philippines, yet the heavens speak to every man in every tongue and to every people. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the psalmist said, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, and the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Psalms 8, 3, 4. When you and I look today with so much information on our fingertips, with our smartphones, we can ask that question again. What is man in relationship with the universe? What is my purpose in this world? Many of us wondered in this world, and where has it gotten us? Today, astronomers are asking, what is man? My brothers and sisters, I say to you, he is the astronomer. He is the one that looks out and measures all of this. God told us to look up, and God called man to look up. He even called the first man that he called aside to make a nation, and he offered him a land off yonder. And even to him, he said, Look up toward the heavens and see if you can number the stars when God spoke to Abraham. You see, the Old Testament ends with God directing man to look up to the heavens. 
Why did God ask you to look? It is because the Old Te Testament closes with a thud. I say to you, the Old, the Old Testament closes in darkness. After reading the Old Testament, you feel incomplete. The curtain comes down before it's completed. The curtain comes down before the human story has ended. It comes down at the first act. It comes down in the tragedy that tragedy has come. Sin has entered the human family. It feels as, as if darkness has fallen down on man. My stepfather and I used to watch Western movies. And every time at the peak of the movies, it appears that the, the bad guys always are winning. But if, and I would ask, is, is, is so so going to win? Are the good guys going to overcome? Of course, I had to just be patient. Sooner or later in any Western movie, the good guys always win, right? My brothers and sisters, when you close the Old Testament, the bad guys are winning. The Old Testament closes in darkness. And God says, look up at the heavens. Don't miss it, especially if you are focused on the things of this world. The Old Testament could be the most disappointing book that man has ever written. There is no final answer. There is no conclusion. There is no answer to the problems of this world. The Old Testament looks, uh, tells us to look up to the heavens. So here is the last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. Let us read. Malachi 4.2 But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. You see, the Old Testament goes in darkness. But the Old Testament goes down and points its fingers to the sunrise. You and I are promised a sunrise. We are in darkness today. We are all waiting for our sun to rise. You see, Japan is called the land of the rising sun because that's where the sun rises from the point of the view of China. Its name Nippon seems, means sun origin. And because some sailors told Marco Polo it was the land where the rising sun back in the 13th century BC. So when you look close to, when you close the book of the Old Testament, Malachi says, God says the son of righteousness is going to rise with healing in his wings. It doesn't conclude with anything. It points us to the heavens. It points us to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the son of righteousness. Brothers and sisters, he comes to usher us a new day. He comes to deal with our sin. He comes to usher a new day of the Lord. He comes to the end, the night of sin, man's sin, and bring in the day of the Lord, kingdom of God upon this earth. You see, the Lord Jesus is called the son of righteousness. He's called the son in the Old Testament. Here is an example of his deity, Psalms 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good things does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless? You see, the Lord is called the Son of Glory. He is the Sun. He is the Light. He is a shield. He is our protection. He has also came to give grace and glory. Isaiah 16, 19, 60 verse 19. The Sun will no more be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine upon you. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. You and I are given a physical eye. As man who practices medicine, the eye is the most miraculous thing I've, I've yet to study. But Charles Darwin described the eye as one of the greatest challenges to his theory. How could he explain it? The eye, after all, is simply incompatible with evolution. Yet we can't even look up at the actual sun. We actually cannot see a lot of light physically. We don't see much of anything anyways. There's a coming a day with the universe, with this curse of sin upon it. 
Our God gave the world a bunch of small candles, which we call stars today. Actually, actually, you and I live in a world awfully dark, unspeakably dark. What has happened in the news lately? A Michigan school high, high school shooting? You see, we live in a dark world filled with sin. But God gave us some light, which we can be seeing in the night sky. God is coming as a son of righteousness. You won't need these physical origins of light. Today, we are told that the sun is expending its energy. It won't last forever. My brothers and sisters, it will run out someday. And our Lord Jesus will be the son of the universe. Yet, we have a son of righteousness that has yet to rise with healing in his wings. And in the Old Testament, calls him as the son of righteousness. He's presented as the son of heavens. But the New Testament, his, his name is not so. He's not presented as the son in the New Testament. You see, the Old Testament is expectation. The New Testament is realization. Old Testament is expectation. New Testament is realization. See, the New Testament closes in an altogether different way. Let's open the book of Revelation. Revelation 22, verse 12 and 13. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now let's drop to verse 16. He says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you the testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. You see, the Old Testament ends with the son of righteousness. The New Testament ends with the bright morning star. But the New Testament doesn't open with the same preface. Old Testament says you are to watch out for the son of righteousness. And the New Testament gives us hope. It doesn't open publicly. It opens privately. Let's look at the Christmas story in the New Testament. One, angel Gabriel presents to Zechariah serving at the altar of incense. Again, Gabriel made a visit to the Virgin Mary in Nazareth, which was a private visit. And lastly, Gabriel presents to Joseph privately in his course. You see, it was all private. But when the public announcement was made, there came out from the east wise men, and they walked down the streets of Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who is born, king of the Jews? We saw his star, not a sun, but a star. And when it rose, we have come to worship him. You see, out of the east, these men were studying the stars. They began to converge in the streets of Jerusalem. You may think that there were three wise men. However, there were probably thousands and thousands of wise men. They came from every direction. They came from the countries like China, from Europe, from Africa. And they said, we have seen the star, and we have come to worship him. You may ask, how did they associate the coming of Christ as a king, as a star? They didn't get it from Malachi or the prophets. You see, they got it from a heathen prophet, Balaam. And then back, back in the book of Numbers, he had a message from God. He gave four prophecies concerning the nation of Israel. And the last one being in chapter 24, verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of all the people of Sheth. Numbers 24, 17. Out of the country of non-believers, a prophecy was given to the Gentiles that a star was coming. They were to watch for a star. So when they saw it, they all converged and went to Jerusalem. You see, the star is a sign of his first coming. The sun is a sign of his second coming to his, this pebble here we call earth. So what does the star really mean? The entire mission of our Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago is wrapped up in a star. 
We always emphasize the birth of our Lord, but I believe it is the cross that deserves a star. His entire coming is wrapped up in this star. It is not his birth that needs emphasizing. It is the death that needs emphasizing and that the star sets forth his death. Our Lord Jesus never asks us to remember his birth, if you think about it. In fact, it is this table in front of us is what he asks us to remember. He instructed us, do this in remembrance of me. He didn't put up a Christmas tree. He didn't put up Christmas lights. Granted, I'm not here to ruin Christmas for everyone. But he said, come all of you around this table. He said, do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There is a star over this table this morning. His entire purpose, the first time, is wrapped up in a star. I'm happy that this month in which we remember his birth, we're going to have communion twice. Let's remember his birth, but let us connect his death with his birth. Because my beloved... It is his death that brings light to you and me. The death of Christ is in the star as well as his birth. You see, the star tells us who he is and why he came. It tells us why he died. It is in the star that said, here I am. It is written about men in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. And first he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you do not need to desire nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. Our Lord came to this earth to do the Father's will. My friends, he came to die on the cross for you. He came to die on the cross for me. Sacrifices of bulls and goats never take away sin. But our Lord, born of a virgin Mary, is to be nailed to a cross for the sins of the world. It is all wrapped up in a star. Yes, it points to his birth, but it also points to his death. I remember being out in the middle of the desert in Afghanistan. Uh, there was a young sailor who um, had an iPhone app. I don't have an iPhone because I'm an Android guy, but he had an iPhone app where you can see all the stars. And in Afghanistan, there's no light, so it's just you see millions of stars. So you can actually see the constellations and everything. And we were looking to... Uh, find where the bright morning star was, where Venus was. And so after 15 minutes, we found it. And then we got into a theological dis discussion, this young guy. And he said he was so amazed that God created these millions of stars for us. And he said, God put a bright golden star in his window. And he thought that the universe was God's window. And it just what a profound statement, I thought. You see, God gave us a star. He was giving his son not to be born primarily, but to die on a cross for the sins of the world. We have had two plus world wars in this century to bring peace. World War I was fought to make the world safe for democracy. It didn't. World War II was to free the world from tyranny and bring peace. Free men from dictators. They didn't make the world safe. They made it very unsafe. A nuclear missile can be launched and kill many people. They created men who could blow themselves up just to prove a point and kill innocent people, which they call infidels. You see, they didn't get rid of dictators. They made a world place full of dictators. There are more today than there have ever been. We won the war, but we lost the victory. There came to this earth 2,000 years ago, the Son of God. God gave his Son in a war against sin. He, d he died to bring men life, to free men from sin. We have brought a victory like of which this world has never seen. The victory over the grave and death. So like the apostles and like us, we can say, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is, where is thy victory? My friends, our hope and future... My future is not in the stars above. My friends, our problems today is not that we got under the wrong star. Our problem is our hearts. He came to deal with the problem that's in our hearts, our sin. Our hope today not is stars, but in the one who is the bright 
and morning star. He brings help for the present. He today alone can enable you to live victoriously in this life. Listen to him in John 16, 33. I've told you these things so that you may have peace in this world. You will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. There's no help in stars for you, but this morning you can look to Jesus, the bright morning star, and he can bring help to you. As we approach this Christmas season, I invite you to the altar. Have you been defeated and discouraged in this world? Have you been looking for a magic formula? Are you looking for lady luck or chance? Maybe the dice hasn't rolled right in your life today. Or maybe you're like so many godless people who are looking to other gods that won't bring them happiness. What is it today that is defeating you? Are you defeated by life? Is it too much for you today? Are you overcome by some habit or addiction? Has alcohol gotten you? Has dishonesty gotten you? Is anxiety and worry overcoming you? Has this pandemic kept you from church? Are you overcome by food? Do you hoard? May you have adopted modern superstition that everything will just work out. Have you been overcome by, by lust or sex? Has materialism overcome your life that you're cold and indifferent to the spiritual today? Our God is able to save to the other, uh, uttermost. The God of the mountains is also our God of the valleys. There's no help in stars. There's help in him, the bright morning star. In the darkness of the night, he appears as the bright morning star. Will you believe in him? Will you believe in his birth? Will you believe in his death? There may be a vapor in Venus or Mars, but today he offers you the water of life. All you have to do is come. Come to his table, and you will frolic like well-fed calves. Today, Jesus Christ is your bright morning star. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us so, that you gave us your Son, that, we, that he can experience all of our joys and all of our happiness and sadness and our fears that you didn't promise us health and wealth, Lord, but you promised that there would be troubles, but to trust in you. Lord, I pray for all of the people here and online that you would call to them, that they would come to you. You come to them with arms wide abandoned, and all we have to do is receive you. In the name of Jesus, our bright morning star. The cradle without the cross would just be another day. It would just be another birth. Um, so we're going to get ready to celebrate communion. And uh, we've talked about it a bit, but we're going to do it a little bit differently today. So uh, I know at times the question is, who can take communion? And we look at communion as a time when we recognize uh, Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We recognize uh, the bread as his body the juice as his blood sacrificed for us and over the last month uh, well with that we've often said you know there's no set time because there are two things that really need to happen in order for someone to take communion the first thing is that they need to understand what communion is and uh, we've often said it here you know if your kids like can I have juice can I, can I have a treat? Well, okay, you're probably not ready. Uh, and the other is, uh, to, so first is to understand what communion is. The second piece 
is to give your life to Jesus Christ. And there are different traditions that do different things, but uh, basically those two things are the things that need to happen. So it doesn't necessarily happen at a specific age or in a specific grade. It has to do uh, with the heart of the individual who's there. So some people don't do it till they're adults. Some people do it when they're younger. Uh, so over this last month, we actually had a young woman who came up to me and she said she wanted to, uh, she knew what communion was all about. So I said, oh really? Okay, why don't you share? So she shared with me what communion was all about. She'd never taken communion before. And I said, that is great. You know what it means. I said, here's the other thing that's necessary if you were to take communion. You need to ask Jesus into your life. You need to ask him to forgive you of your sins and to come into your life and to make you new. I said, have you done that yet? And she said, no. I said, okay, well, that's, that's the next thing. So there's no rush. But I said, you know, you're, you're welcome to talk to me. You're welcome to talk to your parents. I said, but that's really, uh, you know, when those things are done, it is the beginning of your walk because that's really where we're at with communion is just, you know, through our lives, we progress in our faith with Jesus Christ. It's not something where we say a prayer and then we come in and, you know, there's no magic in the communion itself. We do it as a memorial, as a remembrance of the sacrifice he made so that we can go forward remembering what he did for us and then do that for others, to, to thank him, to praise him, and then to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. So uh, Serena, Arenas, uh, is that uh, young girl. And what we did, and they're all different sorts of faith traditions that go on and, and some make a big deal of communion so others not so much um, and I know uh, she's got her grandma here and so what we were going to do is we're going to have her come up with us when we're ready and we're going to have her uh, take communion with us and then everyone else we're all going to take it at the same time but she's going to join us and it was mentioned that uh, which was a great point that uh, we haven't always done this here. So if there's someone who says, you know, I didn't get to do that, if there's, if there's one of our young girls who wants to come up, uh, they're welcome to do that as well. Um, but it's something that often your first communion is, is a really big deal because it is that time when you've given your life to Jesus and you say, okay, I want to live for him moving forward. So, you know, I remember when, so when she came and she told me, it was like, that was great. But the morning, I think it was a week ago, she came up after service and she wanted to share with me that she had given her heart to Jesus Christ. So communion is great and taking first communion is great. But the most exciting news is we were like, we have another child who's entering the kingdom of God. So we praise God for that. And so that is exciting news, and it is that same way. So whether you're here and you're standing up front, it's not about being in front, but we're just going to recognize not as much even that she's taking her first communion, but what we're recognizing the fact that she has given her life to Jesus Christ, which is always great news. Um, so uh, the way communion does work here, we've, we've done it a couple of different ways, but uh, we, we are going to do it where it is, especially with uh, everything going on the way it is right now with COVID and variants and all of this stuff. And we don't want to, we know different people are in different places, but for now we're not going to pass the plate. We do have the little communion cups. We normally do it and we will do it again next Sunday. But uh, we're doing it as Pastor John said it is the perfect transition for that message and we always want to remember you know the cradle requires the cross for salvation you, know, you can't have one without the other so if you don't have a communion cup uh, with you and, and along with that if you're in, you don't have a communion cup but you'd like to take communion with us then you can feel free to raise your hand and uh, Mr. Mark will grab a cup for you. Uh, here are the things that uh, you should know with regards to communion. First, you should have given your life to Jesus Christ. Uh, no one should take communion unless they've given their lives to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then the second thing is, uh, uh, besides knowing what it means, is that we want to be seeking to live for him. So if we know that we're doing things in our life that 
don't go along with what he teaches, we shouldn't take communion. I actually remember at one point it used to just the plate used to pass, and uh, we had a, a, a young man. He was a military man, uh, came in, and you know he knew he wasn't where he needed to be. And when the plate plate was getting passed, uh, he was going to let it go by, and, and the usher at that time, because we had ushers going, no, you can take communion, you can take communion. He came up to me afterwards. And he says, you know, I was kind of being pushed to take communion, and the reality is I know my heart isn't right. And I said, you know, that's a great point. And after that, so that's why we talk about this beforehand, because if you know that you're not living for Jesus and you're not doing things the way you should, then you really should hold off on taking communion until you're in that place. Because when we take communion, we are saying, Lord, I am receiving you. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. I give you everything. That's what we say when we take communion. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a hymn of invitation, and we're actually going to start with something that's a little different for many of you who are here, uh, for those who are of a Catholic background or those who may be a little more uh, of a tradition uh, or a traditional liturgical style, the, the structure, uh, there are places where there are responsive readings. Uh, and it's something we don't do that often here, but we do uh, it every once in a while. So what we're going to do is, uh, for those who want to, the, the piece for... The, uh, the worship leader and people uh, is going to pop up there, but it's also in the hymnal on page 122. So you're welcome to grab a hymnal if you'd like, and that is the lead-in to our hymn of invitation, which is going to be O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a piece, and I'm going to read it, and then everyone's going to join in. It will be up on the screen. Right? Yep, good. I got the thumbs up, so we should be good. So when it pops up on the screen, you're going to share along with me. And the thing that I'll end with is, blessed Son of God. And then we're all going to come in with, we wait, we await him with reverent hearts. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. So that's what we're all going to say together. Who shall come in the fullness of time to gladden the hearts of men? Who shall bring new joy to the world? and the poor and lonely defend? Who shall come on a cold winter's night when the world is hushed and still? Only the silent stars keep watch as a promise is fulfilled. Just as a child newly born, he shall come to a stable rough with sod. Tis gentle Jesus, Prince of Peace, the blessed Son of God. And together... We await him with reverent hearts. O oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. And stay seated and please join me in singing, O come, O come, Emmanuel.
Now we're going to ask Serena to come up and join us. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body given for you. In remembrance of him, we give you the bread. Take. same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me this is the blood shed for you Lord, we thank you so much uh, for your sacrifice on the cross. And Lord, we know that you say that heaven rejoices at just one coming to you. So Lord, we rejoice this morning as we get the privilege of taking communion with Serena and with all the other brothers and sisters in Christ. May this be a special day, not just for her, but for us, as we rejoice and get ready until that day when you call us home. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to, feel free to stand. We're going to just, uh, due to everything going on, we're going to have everything happen right where everyone is standing as opposed to kind of circling and all that. Uh, at some point in time, that may come back, but I'm thinking right now is probably not that time. So. Uh, please join me in singing Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Now, may the grace, mercy, peace, and love of God the Father Almighty, Jesus Christ the Son, our Savior, and Lord, and the blessed Holy Spirit be with each one of you today until Jesus Christ returns and then forevermore. Amen.